question during our break about um, if I'd run across any good examples of B2B social networking gone awry. Um, any good samples? And um, it, honestly, I can't think of any off the top of my head. Um, but I can say that there are some warnings in there. Um, when you're talking B2B social networking and B2B social media sites and where to get into, back to one of the points I made earlier, make sure during your um, strategy phase, um, when you're building that strategy and doing the research to build your strategies, make sure that you research properly your social graphics. And I think that might be one of the next slides, talking about social graphics. Um, if you identify your audience and where they're hanging out early, um, your target audience for either your customer or your, your product line at your company, um, normally you won't run into those huge catastrophes like that. Um, you'll know early if you need to be on Facebook or if you need to be on Twitter or if you need to be on Bebo if you're in, in another country, your product's in another country, or, or you need to be on Friend Feed, or if you're in the music industry and you need to be on MySpace. Don't rule that out. My, MySpace is huge for the music industry. Um, so you'll figure out during your research phase where you need to be. Um, you know, that's marketing 101. Um, we figure out who our target audience is and how we reach them. So just because you're, we're progressing on into a few more um, complex tasks, don't forget our 101 tasks. Um, do, do our research, do our consumer research early and uh, be smart with our strategies. Um, kind of talked about this earlier, why? Why do we even want to go through all of this? Why do, it, this is a lot. This is a whole new process. Now, I told you guys early, let's get out of just thinking about social media because you can see now inbound marketing is huge. Um, it's a huge revenue generator for any, almost any company. I won't say any company, almost any company. So why would you want to go through all that? And it's about this right here. It's about the dollars. And it's about this right here, re-engagement planning on a quick turn. Um, if you've got the right information at the end of your process and you know how, what your bottom line is off of your ad campaigns, that's why you want to do this. <clears throat> okay, we've talked about social graphics quite a few times. Think demographics, but online. Understand their social, your consumer social behaviors. What are they doing online? Are they Googling? Are they using Bing? Don't rule out Bing and Yahoo because in some geographic areas, for some verticals, Bing is much more popular than Google is. So you have to do your research again. Know what their behaviors are or, or are they hanging out on Facebook or on Twitter? Um, so you need to know that. Where, where are they hanging all out of line and, and really um, understand their social behaviors, how they're clicking around. Do they even click on links when they're in Facebook, on Facebook? Or do they just read the little blurbs that are up there? Do you need to catch them in those 20 words on the blurbs, on the descriptions? Or are they looking at the picture attached to your link and that's attracting them? So understand their, be their behaviors. Um, who do your, your customers trust online? We talked about testimonials and customer reviews a few minutes ago during the break. Um, is that how they build your, is that how your target audience builds trust online? Is it through testimonials? Do they need to be on there? Do you need to have your um, past clients talk more um, and do some of those sales um, process for you? So you need to know that early. Um, and then who trusts your customers online? Who are their friends' friends? Think LinkedIn now. Remember the connections and you have your, um, oh gosh, I'm gonna mess up the terminology. You have your connections and then second generation connections and then third generation connections. Remember the circles of friends and they're attached all the way out. Well, who do they trust? When you start interacting in groups on LinkedIn, um, do they trust you more because they're, that you're a friend of a friend of theirs more so than just another guy in the group that's out there talking that's not a friend of anybody? So we need to understand that too. So it may be time to start interacting with more people and even just doing the cosmetic um, task within LinkedIn of friending more people in the groups, the targeted groups that we're hanging out in maybe. And this last one, this last one is another point that we need to make sure and take away from this today. Don't focus on the tools and technology. I like to use the, exa the example of Google's um, catastrophes over the past two years um, in their social communities. They've had Google Wave and Google Buzz. 
They spent millions of dollars in those two social communities, and they were both a flop quickly. They were really bad. Products were bad. They didn't work properly. They targeted the wrong people. And now they come out with Google, um, Google Plus. Who knew on the third try that Google Plus was really going to come out with a quality product that people like to use? Now, the audience is not there yet. So it's probably not a place, even if we were talking B2C, it's probably not a place you want to concentrate on yet. But if we were just focusing our efforts <laughs> on blogging, or just fo focusing our efforts on Facebook, or just focusing our efforts on Twitter, and those communities go away, as they do quite a bit, think MySpace, um, gone out of the, the mainstream um, consumer's eye. Um, if we were just focusing all of our dollars on specific tools and technologies, we'd be in a heap of trouble answering to our bosses on our marketing and advertising budgets. But if we're focusing on our strategies, it doesn't matter then what think mediums, technologies, mediums, like ad campaign mediums, social media technologies, then it doesn't matter what medium we implement our strategies to because our strategies work. Our strategies are solid. Our ad campaigns are solid. The message is good. And we're reaching the right target audience. Then we just go find out where the audience is. And that's where we, we publish our ad campaigns. And we publish you know, any initiatives that come off of our, our marketing initiatives. So don't focus on the tools and technology. That way it doesn't matter what's here today and what's here tomorrow. What's here tomorrow is still going to work because our strategies are solid. All right, we're going to run short on time here. And yes, there's a slide for each of these, and there's probably 20 minutes of conversation we can have for each of these. But I need to get through them pretty quick. Even if we go through them fast, we need to do it. A lot of the stuff we've already talked about. So we're going to run through these real quick. Um, strategic content. We've talked about keyword research, that kind of thing. Getting good, solid strategic content through all of our web entities, our website, our blog, our Facebook page, our Twitter page. Be smart. Make sure we're talking to our consumers. Make sure we're talking to our target audience when we're getting our message out. Um, long tail keyword research. We've already talked about long tail. We remember earlier. Um, keyword focused copy. Copy as in copy on either on your online press releases or on your blog or on your, your website, that kind of thing. Um, Linking around, linking, internal linking and external linking. External linking are those links that come in to your website from the outside. Internal linking is when you're, you're on your about page and you're linking to your bio maybe on the website. So those internal links within the website, Google and Yahoo and Bing still give you credit for linking within websites and blogs. So don't forget that. Optimize information architecture. Um, I don't want to go into this too much because it gets kind of technical, but you guys need to understand what this is talking about. Um, when you have a URL on a website, we're going to the about page maybe on a website, um, and we'll take ours, jsgroup.com slash about, all right? The actual URL at the top. It's very important what's in those URLs up there. We talked earlier about search engines being smart, and they're eliminating the meta tags and the code, but what they're not eliminating is the keywords that are in those URLs. Those keywords in those URLs are very important. So if we had jacegroup.com slash about dash jace or about dash creative advertising agency, Google reads that and their keywords that they throw in those dictionaries. So we have to remember that, that architecture when we start talking about those. And also information architecture, we're talking about um, how you flow the links through your website. Again, you guys won't have to do this, but you'll need to know when your web shop is, your web shop is BSing you. Um, when you have your about page, and maybe you have testimonials, it's always better to have your testimonials embedded under your about page. To go more real world, we had Toyota Camrys. Maybe we sell Dodges, Nissans, and Toyotas. Your Camry page should be under the Toyota folder on your website. So you should go to, uh, I don't know, toyotadealershiparoundhere.com slash Toyota slash Camry. All those words need to be in that, in that URL. And the only way you can do that is to pay attention to your information architecture on your website. So again, you guys probably won't have to get into this because that gets a little technical. But you need, do need to know that it's important and make sure your web team is taking care of that kind of thing for you. Um, it's a great way to earn credit with the search engines. Search engine marketing, <coughs> keyword research, pay-per-click advertising, that kind of thing. Um, search engine marketing, um, 
Facebook advertising and LinkedIn advertising kind of got trapped in this little vehicle right, right here too, even though those, those are not specifically search engines. Um, but paid advertising, it's these links over here on the side in Google. Those are non-organic search links. All, this, all these, these, these results over here is organic search results. Top right. I'm sorry. Links are sometimes now they're putting yeah, in top the top yellow top. at the yeah. top, those are paid ads too. Right, exactly. Exactly. So um, those are very important. There's some tools in here that are important that are going to need to be used by your SEO team and your web team. Um, again, um, you guys just need to be familiar with them and know that they are there, they're out there, um, and your, your tech teams need to be using these kind of things. Um, by the way, I can get a copy of all of this so you have all these terms and get a copy to, okay. to you guys and you get out if you need to. <clears throat> We always give this big disclaimer about social media. Social media is not going to make a whole lot of money for you if it's not part of a larger strategy. Um, you guys won't have to deal with this so much, but a lot of small companies will have the dude down the street in his garage will walk out someday and walk into your front door and say, hey man, let me build a Facebook page for your company. Okay, you're cool, you have a Facebook page now. But it's not making any money for you because there's no strategy behind it. So we have to keep that in mind. And when we're having conversations and we're getting into the minutia of what a Facebook page is doing, sometimes we have to back out for a minute and say, hey, hold on. Do we really need to have this conversation just about Facebook or just about Twitter? And how much does it really affect my whole marketing strategy? And how much does it really affect my bottom line? So um, we have to remember that social media is not going to make or break us. It could damage us <laughs> sometimes if we don't get the right content out there. But um, and social media marketing is just another important piece of your, your um, marketing and advertising campaigns. Um, again, to the, the note how far down the list it kind of follows up with what we were just saying. It's not that silver bullet. So here's an example of some of those social media marketing uh, or social media communities or social communities out there, sorry. Um, based on your research that you've done early about your audience, will determine what social communities you want to, to get out there and spend your dollars in, where you want to send your marketing team to, who you're marketing, where you're marketing associate, associates, gosh, I can't talk now, um, where they need to hang out, out on the internet to get the message out. So your research early is going to tell you this kind of thing. I couldn't tell you how many social communities are out there. And a lot of them are niche social communities, so we have to get out and look for them sometimes, depending on our target audience. Audio and video marketing um, and photo marketing too. Um, depending on the vertical, um, you know, we talked some, uh, well, we talked earlier um, during the break about um, ratings or customer ratings and customer reviews and that kind of thing. And when you get into talking ratings and reviews and testimonials from clients, video is a great way to get information out about your product. Um, we all know how fast videos can go viral on the internet. Um, smartly produced um, and creatively produced videos um, can sometimes do wonders for our brand. So we, we need to go back sometimes when we start planning our um, ad campaigns and start thinking about what mediums we're going to actually advertise on. Don't forget these, these that are sometimes just B2C. They can also fall into B2B sometimes too. Social bookmarking. We talked about these earlier. Here's a list of some of them. Very effective. The audiences are different on different ones. Um, so, you know, again, we're back to our research again. We need to find out where our folks are hanging out. And sometimes we just need them for the number of inbound links coming back to our website. Stumbled upon is one that not many people have ever even heard of that will create hundreds of links to a blog article. And if you just need the numbers for Google, Stumble Upon is a good place to put your information out there. Get those inbound links coming back in. I suggest that there's some here that you may not be familiar with or you're not familiar with <coughs> the tool. You know, my suggestion is go and go to the website, take a look, you know, right. play with it to see what it's doing differently. Dig versus delicious versus stumble on. I don't think we do enough of that, so I would encourage you to at least take a look at what's happening. Okay. Right. And uh, sometimes the tough part about communities like these is they change hands so often. 
Delicious was just bought by, oh man, I'm going to mess this up. The two guys that founded Twitter? No, YouTube. YouTube. The two guys that founded YouTube. They just bought, what? Oh, sorry. Um, they just bought this, this community, Delicious, that was on the way down the tubes. And now they've done some cool things with it, so people are going to get excited, which brings masses to that community, which when the masses start rolling in, that's probably a place you want to start getting your message out. Email marketing. It's an old school way to advertise. Um, it got a bad rap at one point um, when the spamming thing started happening in the, what, early 90s, I guess. Um, but we can't leave it out. We're building this massive database with all these leads um, that are coming in. Even the leads that don't always get closed by your sales team, we still have this database out there of people that we want to keep in touch with. Um, for the most part, email marketing is an inexpensive way to get a message out, to get an announcement out, to send a video out, to get traffic coming back to your website, to say hello at Christmas time to some consumers that are, you know, have gone by the wayside. Um, and again, it, it's just another medium off of the ad campaigns that you may already be running, maybe, uh, like I said, maybe around the holidays. And it's not that expensive to get your creative team to to snap up or fix up a, a, a quick email newsletter or, or whatever your information is that's going out. You know, and, and you know, a good sized company will have an email database in the millions. So there's no reason not to tap into that audience and remind them that you're out here. Smart web development, we talked about that a little bit earlier. Um, these are terms that you guys need to understand. You don't need to know how to do them. You more than likely won't have to go in and I should get into the cut of the website. But you need to know if somebody's BSing you. You need to know if your web team's BSing you. Um, we talked about meta tags earlier, title tags, keywords, tags, and description tags. Those are kind of going away. XML sitemaps is XML. We've probably all heard that term. Um, it's a file that sits off on the server. You don't even see it. It's written in XML. It's written in code. And it's an index of all the pages in your website. So when Google comes to your website, it looks at that XML file first to see what pages to go look at. So if there's not an XML sitemap attached to your web entities, your blog and your website, remember some websites are in the tens of thousands of pages, if there's no XML sitemap out there, you just got moved down in the priority list by all the spiders. Because they're not going to spider through and find all those links. They'd rather go to a website that gives them an index. So again, you don't need to know how to create it, but you do need to know that it's very important that it needs to be there. HTML sitemap, that's pretty much for your consumers, actually, that it's coming to your website. Sometimes you click a sitemap link. A lot of times it's down in the footer, and it'll give you um, links on your website. Uh, that's a nice to have. Image alt tags and hyperlink title tags. When you hover over an image and the little bubble window pops up and gives you a text description, those need to be on all your images. And all your hyperlinks, when you hover over a hyperlink and the bubble window comes up, search engines read those tags. Search engines cannot read flash movies, and search engines cannot read images. They have an image search engine out there, but it just grabs them. It doesn't know what they are. It can't read the code behind those, those JPEGs that are out there, or PNGs that are out there. So those little title tags have to be there. That's the only thing that a search engine can read when it comes to an image. So... Again, you don't need to know how to do them, but you need to know that they need to be there. Otherwise, it just gets ignored, um, and the search engines don't see it. Permalinks, we talked about the URLs and friendly, um, friendly text in the URLs up there. A lot of blogs call them permalinks. They get rid of, sometimes you'll see URL, URLs that have question marks and ampersands in them and a whole bunch of goofy stuff. Um, permalink technology takes all that out and puts your keywords in the URLs. So once again, you don't need to know how to do that. You need to know that it's supposed to be there. Semantic code is just formatting code. There's, when you go to a web page, you can right click in a white space on a web page and view source, and it gives you all the code behind the website. You don't need to know how to read it, but you need to know that it's following a format. Indentions are done properly in the code. Your code's just not like um, 2,000 lines of code just going back and forth. It's indented properly, it's semantic. Um, search engines need to have code written that way. You don't need to know how to read it, but you need to know it's, it's done properly 
so that your web shop's doing their job and is not penalizing you in the search engines for something you have no control over. Just a quick question on this. I mean, if, if you looked at a lot of the websites, is, is it unusual to find ones that are correct or incorrect? Um, today, more so than sooner because, or than earlier, because of the tools have gotten better, um, it's more common to find them correct. Okay. Now, it, it depends, it depends on the developer, yeah. If you get developers sometimes that go in there and they're in a hurry, and they'll start copying and pasting stuff from all over the place, all over pages, it gets messed up a lot. So those are the ones you have to look at sometimes. Um, it's probably good to read the personality of your web developers, your web team. If they're just scatterbrained all over the place, more than likely it is probably like that. Because <laughs> it's not important to them. I mean, you know, you have to know all the members on your team. You know, and sometimes web developers, they don't care about leads. I mean, they're there, you know, pay me. I'm, doing, I'm building your pretty website. You should be happy, you know. So there are some things that's just not on their priority list. So if the tool doesn't do it for them properly, a lot of times it doesn't get done. So you got to take a peek every once in a while. Make sure they're doing it right. We talked about these landing pages, online call to actions. Call to actions, just getting someone to perform an action on your, on your website. Um, these are just some examples of the type of things you can do. Um, don't be afraid to make them bold on your landing page. Talked about showing you a sample of a well, uh, landing page earlier. We talked about the navigation. Somebody over here asked about, was that you that asked about the navigation? Let them get back to the home page. All right, well, this isn't a sample of a landing page. All the navigation's gone off the top, but the logo over on the top, it's clickable and it goes back to the website. Um, this is a link to, uh, a way to download a webinar. The folks already knew what they were getting into before they came to this page. So the web form's at the top for them to fill it out. There's a full description of what's in the webinar. They enter their information, page reloads, and they have the webinar sitting right there waiting for them. We got a lead out of it. We got contact information out of it. So it's a great example of a landing page. There's some other actions that they can perform and share over on the side also. So we talked for a long time about landing page and it looked kind of simple, but there's a strategy behind that. Um, we talked about A-B testing a little while ago. Um, again, it looks very simple, but we've done a lot of testing with how these things lay out, how these landing pages lay out for webinars, and these have been very successful like this. So you have my email address, so what do you do with that? It goes in our database for newsletter announcements. So I will get something in the mail from you? Yes. Yeah. Of course, without doubt. I mean, we don't do anything cheesy or anything. And we actually don't spam our folks very often. So because of the webinar I clicked on gives you an idea of the subject material I am interested in. Yeah. Yes. Yes, correct. Brand monitoring, we talked about that a little while ago. And there are tons of ways to do this, both offline and online. Um, Google Alerts is a great one. Yahoo Pipes, Technorati. Um, Backtype is a great um, conversation um, tool for blogs. It'll take comments off of Twitter and comments off of Facebook. It's talking about your blog article and bring them all in the comments section on your blog. So all the comments from all those communities are back here. So you can control the conversations that are going on. Twitter search and social mention. Social, social mention works similar to Google Alerts. When your name's mentioned out in Twitter or on Facebook, or whatever term you put in, they'll notify you right away. They'll let you know you're being talked about. Well, I would imagine that's... <laughs> could be. Could be. Could well, absolutely what, what be. Do it's worse if they're not talking about you. I can tell you that much. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> I guess. Um, yeah, I, well, I, I a good size company. A good size company. You want to see that big picture. Are they talking about me in the United States? Are they talking about me in Germany? Are they talking about my my new car in Atlanta? Or are they talking about my new car and I haven't even rolled it out in Detroit yet? So you can get. So you're not um, looking at that to actually contact. Or I would think so on the B two B side. I wouldn't think so. Um, I would say that it's worth a scour from an associate, 
an associate level person, you know, to every once in a while to make sure nothing negative out there is going on. So you can go do reputation management real quick if you need to. Um, but yeah, I think big picture is probably better. When you start one of these uh, Google Alerts, for example, uh -huh. does it bring up anything from the past or just no. from the day you They're started? They're going Google forward. Okay. Yeah. It's mostly news, like from, I mean, one that I saw like the Wall Street Journal or right. Google.com talk about this person or right. something. Like, it's mostly, like, you can get it like once a day. Yeah. Like everything from that day. So you set how often? Yeah. Yeah, they'll send you a in digest, the, too. In the in um, other class that I teach, um, this we use for tracking um, failures and complaints. Yeah. So we know we have what's going on for our brain, what's being said, right? So. Do some damage control. Yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. Right. Um, so to Professor Metcalf's comment about sort of like, all right, so what? So people are talking about you positively or negatively. Mm -hmm. and this summer I worked on Radiant Six, where obviously it aggregates all the right. all the from wherever. Right. So that's really intricate. And I was tasked with like trying to figure out now what is part of one of my projects. I didn't know, nobody knew in a big organization. Right. How do you tackle that opportunity um, based on obviously people are hearing people, they're talking about right. your product more from the BC. Right. What what are you know, what's being done to take that next step and funnel it into the actual sales action process? Right. I think um, I think if we if you can take if you can take the results of those studies or the results of that data, um, and you can separate it off based on social graphic studies as, or so, social graphic categories, as in um, are people talking about me on Facebook, or are people talking about me on Google, or are people talking about me on Twitter, then I can know more where to target my advertising. Um, so it goes back up the line to these guys that make the decision on where I spend my ad dollars more so than what the salespeople can do with it. If we're still talking about the comments, is that what we're still talking about? When your name's mentioned? Versus Radio 6 to begin with, you don't know where they're from. You can't explain the algorithm. You're, you're, you're not like people's location. No, I, I read a lot, I read Amber's blog almost every day from Radian 6, and I've never used their tool, but if they don't give geographic information off of the information that's coming, it seems kind of useless, which sounds like what you found out. Um, and, and, and it's simple. Geographic, geographic um, sources are simple. I mean, you do that by IP address. Um, and if they're not doing that, I don't know, you, you would need it. I mean, I think I threw a question in there too, but um, yeah, I, I think I'm with you. I would be lost with that information too if it didn't give me all of it. Well, that's the top source for brand health, as far as I understand. Right, so it I is popular, so. so. Some way to take that and translate it, to monetize it in some way. Right. I guess, I guess that's what I'm asking. Right, yeah, it, um, you know, I would need that information. I, I would have to know geographic information. I mean, any vertical that you work in, um, even, even brands as big as Nike, targeting women's running shoes in Atlanta, you're not gonna be able to use the same message that you do in Tokyo, even though you're targeting women and running shoes. So geographic area is huge. Brand health. In other words, building, you talked to some degree about brand building, I think. Right. I forget how you termed it. So that's a different thing. That's not a targeting strategy. That's like, how do you develop your brand based around social buzz? Is that different than what you thought? Well, about? brand, brand kind of, kind of ties into that too. I mean, if you're developing a brand, back to the basics of what is a brand. A brand is what people think about you. Um, if I'm targeting, let's go back to the example I used. If I'm targeting women in Atlanta with, you know, whatever product or whatever brand that I'm doing uh, or servicing, I'm going to use a different message to those guys, even if it's a brand campaign, than I am the folks in Tokyo. I mean, they're not going to care about 
hot, humid weather and running shoes for my brand, and is it going to make me feel better by wearing these shoes? I mean, I'm being a bit facetious about you know Nike and their running shoes, whereas if you're you're talking to people in Tokyo that live in the mountains in the snow area, you're going to have to brand your product to them a little bit differently. So I think I'm still back to you got to have those, you got to have that information, I would think, at least in this case. All right, analytics. Analytics, uh, we've talked quite a bit about analytics, um, even going off into the web trends world where it gives you a whole lot infor more information than Google Analytics. <coughs> if, you're in, if you're working in a large organization, for the, for the most part, they're going to be hosting their own web entities. They're going to have their own IT department. They're going to have their own data center. They're going to have their own intranet, that kind of thing. And they're probably going to open their DMZ up and host their own websites. So your IT department there is going to have some sort of tools that, that they're going to provide to you for analytics. Um, so you just need to find out what they are. Most of them work very similar. Once you understand one, you can pretty much understand the concept of all of them. Um, a tool like Web Trends will give you so many more reports and slice and dice the data so much better than a free product like Google Analytics does. But um, for the most part, it works. The type of information you want to be looking at, and let me throw a disclaimer on the, this analytics thing. If you ever get to the point where you're working with analytics on a daily basis, don't drive yourself crazy with it. <laughs> um, you can get addicted to numbers sometimes. You can... Oh my God, the campaign launched today. I got to get in at 10 a.m. and see what's going on. And I got to go back in at 2 p.m. or the more people there. Don't. You got to look big picture. You got to look at trends. You got to look at what's working in a campaign. Um, maybe when we change the landing page, um, you got to work what's, look at what's working here or this month over that month or maybe this fall season over last fall season, that kind of thing. So, so think big picture with your analytics. And, um, Another piece I threw in down at the bottom, your marketing and sales conversion rates. Make sure your analytics tools, um, i.e. a HubSpot tool, or for like in our case with our clients, we built our own Jace marketing management tool set. Make sure that tool set, your conversion rate um, um, tools, integrate with your analytics. Remember, we talked early about we've got to make sure that the, these and this, these people in this team support that dollar amount down at the very end. And the only way you can do that is come back to them and say, hey, man, it didn't work. Not only by numbers and page hits, it didn't work by dollars also. So make sure your analytics tools are giving you conversion rates. Well, how, how do you know which ad, which promotion, ad campaign, whatever you want to call it, Cause that sale to occur. Landing page. Huh? Landing pages. No, no, no. You gave those. You gave those leads to that sales guy over there. Right. How do you know? How do you know exactly it was this ad campaign did it or maybe something else? Because that, that person, that potential client, is tied to that lead that comes across. So you have you have you have. A, closed loop system somehow right. that sale gets back to yes. somebody marketing. Yes. And he yes. says, okay, that was the lead generated off this at home. Right, okay. right. That's what these tools do for you down here. Like our marketing manager tool set and like a HubSpot tool, something like that, it wraps all that back in together. It is a closed loop system. So it may take you three months before you got that lead <clears throat> closed. It may take you three months before you got could. It depends on the, the how long your sales cycle right. is. Right. So it could, yes. You were able to tie that back to the product. time you gave him that lead. That's, that gets credit to that campaign. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Wow. <clears throat> yep, it could in some cases. So you may not know how effective that campaign is. Weeks, months. If it takes that long. For the it's possible. Out, it's possible. It depends on the product. Yeah. Yep, it's possible. Yep. Do you guys work marketing analytics in here as well? Do we? Marketing analytics. Do we? Yeah. Yes. Okay. You yeah. use them? I'm sorry. Automation. Salesforce automation? Yeah. Um, do, you use, do you use marketing Salesforce automation here as well? Yes, yeah. we do. That Our tool set that we've created takes That's care right. of that part of the process also. Yes. So this sorry, is an app where you create? Yes. You don't yeah. It's privilege combination through your clients? <clears throat> yes. 
I pay extra for that, or I get that when I sign up with you? It's part of the package. Okay. You don't sell that. Mm -hmm. I, okay. Mm -hmm. No, it's part of our package. And just to review, real quick, we're starting to close this out. Um, so just to review some of the, 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 main, the main reason for me putting the slide back up here again is there are tons and tons and tons of techniques and tactics that's part of inbound marketing. I only touched on some of them. I've been up here for two and a half hours now and we've only talked about some of these. I mean, we could talk for days and days and days. The thing to remember, um, just like with social media because it's so new and it's so fluid, there's not always a right and wrong answer about everything. Um, just like in our case where we've created all these test beds where we figured out what's right and wrong. We can't always rely on numbers. We can't always rely on someone else's results because things different from vertical to vertical and geographic area to geographic area. Um, I want to show you a couple of examples of the way we tie in our outbound marketing into this whole set. This is a center court banner hanging in the middle of a mall in Chesapeake and it's advertising for a community and you can see there is a phone number at the top but there's also a landing page up there on that big mural. Um, this is one of our ad campaigns actually our our creative guys created all this um, and this landing page was very very effective. Um, we were not very sure how this was going to work now we're talking B2C here um, because we're talking about folks buying condo community or buying a condo. Um, we weren't real sure how this was going to work in the middle of a mall, um, but either people were remembering it or they were pulling out their iPhone and checking out the URL, um, but it was very effective for them. So you, you can tell too, us being an inbound marketing agency, we were very always very leery about throwing a phone number up there, but we did here because we weren't sure how it was going to work, and it actually worked very, very well. This is the sample of one of the direct mailers I was telling you guys about. This is a Halloween, I mean a Valentine one um, that we did last year, I guess. Um, and the front of the direct mailer and the back of the direct mailer, and the only call to action is a URL on here. So offline advertising, and it all gets tracked back into our system um, through lead management. Um, and in that conversation, the, the main thing I want to get to you guys about how we handle this is all of these people are in the conversations. Based on all of this here, you can see all these different roles have to be in these conversations for this to be effective. Now, a larger company um, and even some of our larger clients, if they were working this in-house, that would be almost impossible to get a team together every month. But at least every, or every week, at least every month, each of these roles should be involved in the conversations to understand what works and what does not work. And the accounting team needs to understand that they are very, very important in helping us determine what actually works back at the beginning of this process so we can change where we need to change. So it's no longer just the creative team and the marketing team working in their little bubble and arguing back and forth over, no, I gotta have this done, and the creative director yelling down, no, we're not gonna do it like that. It's not that way anymore. Um, our, the way our advertising agencies and our marketing agencies um, have changed these days are functioning more like this. More people from more departments have to be in the conversations and have to have input. Oop, I think I finished. Yep, that's it. Any questions? Anything? One um, case study that I've been thinking about in the, since been in the news the last weeks, and I don't think it could have happened without social media, is Netflix, and mm -hmm. I mean, their stock dropped like 35% yeah. this week or something, and it's because of all the pushback they're getting from people on Twitter and Facebook and everything else about right. all these changes they're making. So how much do you think that their decisions to waffle back and forth on all this have been influenced by these people and are they, is it just kind of the way things are going to be from now on or is there something about Netflix that they just can't stick to their guns and say this is the right decision? No, I think it's, I think it's huge and it's very, um, it's very typical of the way, the way our consumers are today. They can hear each other talking now, where before consumers couldn't hear each other talking. It was either through a feedback form or calling a complaint line on a telephone call. 
Um, and maybe you ran into somebody at the mall or at church and they said, oh, yeah, I didn't like this product either. Well, oh, yeah, I didn't either. Well, it's not like that anymore. You can hear the next 200 guys beside you on Twitter complaining. And good or bad, um, something has to be done about those complaints. Um, Netflix made a business decision to change what they changed. It sounded like, I don't know the details of their internal conversations, but it sounded like if they didn't change those policies and the way they ran things, they were going to go out of business. So they had to change. Um, but consumers didn't care because it ended up being a worse product after they changed things. I think they backed off on some of it. Right, right. It is. It is. Well, we, all of us as a team, and going out into the business world and becoming decision makers, we have to take into account that those people are out there. Whether they're right or wrong, the complainers are out there, and we have to listen to them. Um, how you decide to tackle their complaints you know, is probably up to the company internally, but you have to listen. You have to listen, or if you're a publicly traded company, man, you're going down quick. Um, Can I make a comment about this one? Because this, this is also sort of, I study boneheaded decisions like this, and um, <laughs> this was one of the stupidest things I have ever seen. It, to me, you could have used social media or a smaller set of little panel of experts to throw the idea out there and see how pissy people are going to get. Like, this is just, talk about a, 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 what came across as an absolutely greedy, Simply greedy business decision that got like, it, it's possible that they destroyed the brand just like that. Right. And I don't know about you guys, but I'm not about to throw this out into the world of social media and hope to God it doesn't blow up in my face. I mean, it's just astoundingly stupid. Yeah, it wasn't smart at all. And then he sends back an apology letter, which was basically admitting, yes, we were greedy. And uh, did you get one of these? Yes. Right? Yeah, we and did. you just read through it, you're going, dude, you're just going to make it worse. Just shut up. <laughs> Do what's right for the customer. And, you know, but, I, I, you know, I'm sure this was a calculated decision. I'm going to get a certain churn because right. of it. And it's in my calculations that because I do that, I'm, I, I can lose a certain number of my customers and right. I'll still be better off. And I just don't, <laughs> I mean, wow. I think they lost 800,000 subscribers. Yeah, they, I've seen some of these yeah. graphs that have come back. Which means instantaneously, too. That's what's so crazy. crazy. And I'm, I'm just a little, I'm a little surprised that a company as sophisticated as they, I thought, were didn't use maybe a little bit of the social media to sort of right. feel first what the response was going to be before they had mass hysteria, because that's what it was. Well, know? I think they've been having problems lately with their agreements with Disney and Warner Brothers and Sony about right. what they can show, and so I think part of it is panic mode. They do need more revenue. Everybody's trying to, yeah, create, uh, control content, but wow, I don't know. I just think they should have been a little more careful about, let's just throw it out there and see what happens. Uh, <laughs> maybe they did, but we didn't see it. Mm -hmm. I don't know. So since this is so content and, and quality content driven, as a small company, how do you deal with the mass quantities of quality? It's both quality and quantity that you've got to get out there to get this in, these inbound customers or inbound leads coming to you. So how do you deal with that type of quantity? Right. Um, as, a, as a company owner that looks at the bottom line every day. It was hard a couple years ago, maybe three years ago now, when I had to figure that I had to dedicate so much time to generating this quality content for us, just for our company. Um, and it's even harder for me to sit in the conference room with another company owner and, and try to sell this service to them, telling them that they've got to dedicate this kind of time to them. Um, it took, me get, it took me for my company getting into the cycle and starting to see the return on what we were doing, 
before I ever felt comfortable with the amount of time that we had to dedicate to it and that we still dedicate to it. Um, but now we're, we're in that cycle over and over and over, over quarter over quarter um, where we're growing and I can directly attribute it to content generation out on the internet. Um, so now it's easy. At the beginning, making the decision was not easy because uh, we had to jump in. We had, it wasn't something you could do gradual. You had to get in there and we had to get all that content out there and get it going. So it, it's kind of hard because you have to dedicate the man hours to get it done. That's all there is to it. There's no way to cheat it. You can't generate quali quality content by copying and pasting from somewhere else. You've got to generate it with, um, with smart brains, with people that understand the business. So it's either you do it yourself or you hire somebody. Right. You, you hire a copywriter. Right. That's exactly right. 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 And, and SMEs in the industry. I mean, like, we have one guy on our tech team that blogs. So I'm, playing, I'm paying a freaking .NET programmer to blog once a week. But I have to. Um, it helps us generate business on that side of our, our world. So we have to do it, which is from a business decision. If you did a case study on this 20 years ago and, you know, you talk to a small business owner and you're, you know, paying a dot net programmer, you know, whatever per hour, and you know, you're doing what? You're asking them to write an article once a week? That's just crazy. But the return's there now, so it's easier now. Um, so it is part of our challenge when we go in and talk to a fresh marketing director or a fresh VP that doesn't understand the process yet and doesn't understand any of the stuff now that you guys have been introduced to or, or um, continuing your education on. A lot of business owners out there now, even in larger companies and a lot of decision makers out there, don't buy into this because they can't see the return yet. They can't tangibly see that return yet. So it's hard to flip the switch and say, okay, I'm gonna invest in that. Well, I just think it's funny if we're gonna personalize, like I could update content all day just on my personal life, much less a company. So right. it's just, it's odd to think that that type of content. Right. And, and people, um, customers get angry <laughs> sometimes. Like, yeah. you know, you blog or you even tweeted in like two minutes. Yeah. So like people, yeah, yeah. people get angry. So you have to keep that yeah. fresh and you have to, going. You have to keep those patterns going. Yeah, Lord knows you can't lose your audience. I know. So. Can I actually have advertising companies embrace <coughs> in their marketing or they still think they're still sitting on the right to try to get before they start on the left side. And they say, yeah, it's fine, but you need to go back to the traditional way. Or I'll give you the Jace answer. I'll give you the Jace answer. I hope not <laughs> because we're taking their business away from them. Um, I'm being funny about that, but it, it, it's true. A lot of the larger advertising agencies have not bought into it yet um, because they still see social media the way every, almost everyone saw it two years ago. It's just a fad. It's and just yeah, something that's out there. Could they? Well could they? Yes. Um, we would have to go in um, and say, yes, we'll do this. But in order for us to be successful, we need to understand what you have going on. We need to understand your business. We need to understand your strategy for your clients. And we need to meld in with those strategies. We can't work independently and just say, oh, okay, it's going to succeed. We have to be a part of those campaigns that are going on. Mm -hmm. And then they would work. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Well, I think that kind of gets back to what, I'm sorry, I didn't to That's okay. I think that kind of gets back to um, what I think a little bit unique about your organization, and that is, and I've heard a lot of companies talk about this kind of stuff, and um, you keep on going back to the strategy part of it, right? And, and um, maybe we ought to explore that idea a little bit further because basically the way I take it is, it is this social media, the tools that you have are just tools and you're applying them to reinforce a strategy that's right. already in place, that's right. that's in place, right? right. Um, and some companies are just not looking at social media as the same right. level of tool. That right. kind of what that's true. Right. Yes, very. Um, and that's unfortunate because it really is just one other tool you right. can use. Right. Right. 
and a whole audience that you may not be reaching with other mediums that you're publishing in. Yeah. That's the big thing. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. I mean, there's several people that have spoke up in here today that rely on shopping on the Internet. They rely on, you know, right. what are people talking about on the Internet? So as a company owner or decision maker, why would you omit those people? Mm -hmm. I mean, they're there in masses now, mm -hmm. and the numbers are only growing. Um, I should have said this earlier probably too. When we talk social media, when we talk social communities, we include blogging in that because of the social aspect of that. So when we talk about web entities, web entities is a blog and a website. But social communities is your blog, your Facebook page, your Twitter account. It's where the interaction's going on and where current content is being published around through the Internet. So we include blogging in with that also. Somebody picked that. Yeah. Um, do you try to look out for social media influencers and work with them to get the message of your company across and do things, I'm thinking like, rather than you know blogging on your own site, but also doing guest blogging? And if so, how do you determine the influencers that you need to reach out to in either um, the different um, social media sites? Right. Just very right. interested about um, that type of relationship as well. Yes, and that's kind of a touchy subject. Um, when we go in and we work with clients, it's very hard sometimes to get clients to generate new partnerships that their old school minds don't see as partners. Um, an old school business owner and even an old school decision maker sees another company as competition more so than they do a partner. Even some of their partners they see as competition. So it's hard to get them sometimes to go out and get those influencers to team up with them. It's hard for them to buy in to going and getting those influencers to team up with them. So you have to be smart. Do we do that? Yeah, we do. Um, and we generally do it by topic. If there's folks that are SMEs, that are subject matter experts on certain topics out on the Internet, um, we'll try to partner with those or to help our clients partner with those to help spread the word. Yeah, definitely. Especially... How do you t determine them? You have to know them. I mean, by knowing what they talk about, what they blog about, what they travel around the country talking about. So just by knowing what they do for a living every day um, and knowing who their audience is. We talked about social graphics, graphics earlier. You're almost doing a social graphic study on that influencer. Who trusts them? Who do they trust? What communities do they hang out, out in? Who's their second generation friends and who are their third generation friends and that kind of thing. So you almost have to do your study on those influencers also. And the negative side of that is you need to know who their enemies are too because their enemies may end up being your partners um, or your client's partners or you know, your company's partners or that kind of thing. So when you start putting trust in partners, you have to do your due diligence on your partners also. So again, we're back to the touchy piece. You know, is getting that influence worth it? Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. Sometimes you back off. I'm oh, sorry. Sitting comfortably. <laughs> <laughs> you good? I'm yeah. oh, great. Go ahead. Can you turn from this? Are online directories of any significance anymore? I know Yahoo directory still charges around $200 just right. for a simple listing. Right. Um, some of them. We use them every once in a while to generate um, inbound links coming back in. Um, to different web entities. Um, a lot of times we don't trust them. SEO is, SEO is another touchy subject. Um, over the years we've worked, with, we've come in on new clients to rescue clients that have been blacklisted on the Internet. Um, they've either been blacklisted by Google or blast, blacklisted by the old Microsoft search engine or by Yahoo. And it's a large venture to undertake to get them out of the hole and for being penalized um, by Google, uh, which means you're totally taken out of the direct out of the dictionaries, out of Google servers and dictionaries, and you're placed at the bottom of the list on everything, and you're not going to be priority for a long time. Um, and those directories have been the cause of a lot of that a lot of times creating duplicate content on the internet is a mark against you. 
if you have a blog over here and a blog over here and they have the exact same information on them and you're just trying to generate links back and forth, you get penalized for that. Well, that's sometimes what those directories do. You don't know exactly everything that they're doing with that information and the articles you're submitting to them. Um, so if they're doing that, it penalizes you and your web entities. So it's a risk you gotta figure out. And being that we've been through trying to get folks unblacklisted and the nightmare and the many tens of thousands of dollars they had to spend to get out of the hole like that, it's kind of risky to go with directories. At one time they were hot, <laughs> but it's, some people still recommend them, but we're very leery to recommend directories now. Oh, you're welcome. You're welcome. On behalf of the class, we'd like oh, to have, wow. thank you for coming in and talking to us. There's a thank small you. token of our appreciation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you.